Hey, you guys. Time again for the matinee show. This week we're doing, uh, we actually did get to the theater once this week, so we're doing a theater movie at the end. And then yeah. the other ones we're doing a Shutter exclusive and a Netflix original. Yeah. So we're covering all the bases. Uh, we've been doing that quite a lot. The first one that we're going to talk about, oh man, you guys, I was so excited when I saw this pop up. <laughs> this popped up, I was not expecting it, popped up on Shutter, And this is a documentary about Tom Savini. Yeah. Now... You guys better know who the fuck Tom Savini is. But I have to tell you this. Like, I was really excited when I saw this come out because I am a massive, massive Tom Savini fan. When I was a kid, uh, I went to our old, like, video store, which was, like, an old shitty movie gallery with, like, a porn thing in the back. And they had a document, old documentary about Tom Savini, which came out probably in the mid-'80s. I want to say it was, like, 86, 87, something like that. And I rented it, and I copied it. You know, I pirated it. Uh, on our like little double deck VCR, and I watched it over and over and over yeah. and over again, just because I was so fascinated by him as a character, and also because uh, I at the time I was kind of like throwing around the idea of maybe doing. She uh, likes Savini because Savini's a real man. He's a real man. <laughs> He's a real man. <laughs> the thing that's cool about Savini, and like I, I will say, this documentary, um, it was made by um, a, a filmmaker, obviously, but he, he's also a special <clears throat> effects guy named Jason Baker. I believe he got all or most of the funding for this on Kickstarter. Um, I don't really know how much it costs. I will say from the outset that from a from a technical standpoint, um, you know, as far as like editing and sh things like that, the, you know, the the documentary is a little uh, clunky or workmanlike. I guess I should say it's not like you know super spectacular or anything. But if you are into Tom Savini like as a person, because I feel like the old one that they made about him that I saw a million times. That focused a lot more on his, on the movies he worked on and like the special effects work and how he, um, you know, how he accomplished certain effects and things like that, um, which, that, which that's cool and that's interesting, but I like that this documentary didn't really go the same route as that. It does go a little bit into that, but it kind of goes more into him as a person and like his background, his personal life, like why he made certain career decisions, like why... So a, a lot of the bulk of it is like interviews with him, interviews with, you know, people who worked with him at varying times. And it, so it kind of goes a lot about his development as a person and as an artist and stuff like that. And like I said, like you said, one of the things that I always liked about Savini, one is he seems to love horror. He's very enthusiastic about and he still is. And however old he is now, he's got to be in his 60s, even though he doesn't really look it. Yeah, we, um, saw, we saw him one time. Yeah, he we saw sit, him a couple years ago. Yeah, he was uh, sitting over the table. I says, "I see it as Tom Savini," and he looked at me like, "Fuck you, man." <laughs> it was funny. It was funny. Well, for a time when he was wasn't funny. when he wasn't really working a lot, um, yeah. and he gives a reason for that uh, in the documentary, but yeah. he was kind of like solely supporting himself by going to, to the conventions. Yeah. You know, the circuits of conventions, and like mm -hmm. you know, paying people had to pay like to get his autograph and stuff like that, which a lot of uh, people have to do. Yeah, he was sitting there. He was looking fucking bored. He's looking kind of bummed, waiting for people to show up. Yeah, he was um, doing a lot. Of, pretty much every horror convention I've yeah. ever been to, he's been at. Yeah, I saw him. I said, "I see a Tom Savini." <laughs> and he looked up and just was like, "Man, look." Okay. <laughs> well, he probably gets that like probably a million gets that times. All the time, yeah. Although I have to say that I mean I met him once a very long time ago at another horror convention, and. He always struck me, like, from his interviews, like I said, one thing I love about him is, like, his enthusiasm. Like, he is, yeah. and he even, like, went into that a little bit on this documentary about how, you know, he doesn't consider it, like, uh, insulting when somebody says stop acting like a child or whatever because he thinks that's good, like, to keep kind of a childlike mentality. Most people that, like, interv that were interviewed about him, that had worked with him, that included, like, George Romero, uh, Tony Todd, people like that. And they just said that he was super fun, and he's just like, you know, he gets shit done, but he's yeah. he's real enthusiastic, he's real childlike, and it's like, he's always like ready to kind of play around and do shit like that. He was a photographer in Vietnam. Yeah. He saw a lot of cool shit in Vietnam, people blowing up, took pictures of it. He did some shit, he, tell, he tells some Vietnam stories. He wasn't in a frontline unit, but you know, he did the, he did some cool service, you know. He didn't just stay at home or anything. And, uh, you know, he, he's big into... Th throwing hatchets and fencing and guns and explosives, you know, he's into cool shit. Yeah, so, I mean, like I he said, he likes guy stuff. Yeah, but it, but in a way that's like he always came off to me like just a genuinely good dude. He just seems yeah. like a nice man. Well, that happens when you have guys that are well well rounded. 
and balanced. Yeah, you know and I mean? he's like a renaissance not, man yeah. too. See, he's not a hater. If yeah, he, he doesn't. Yeah. yeah, he doesn't seem like a mean person, right. By any stretch. Well, a lot of, the of times, if a guy doesn't, if he's not real well rounded, he'll get jealous of something else, of something that somebody else can do. So then he start talking shit. He's talking shit because you can't do it. Well, t- yeah. Savini's kind of guy. If he sees you, you can do some cool shit, he'll be like, "Oh man, it was cool. I like that." Yeah, yeah, like I said, he's he very not much. A hater. He does not. Yeah, yeah he doesn't yeah. seem like that type hater. of person at all. Right. And like you said, that's probably why. And I really yeah. liked. I was really fascinated by a lot of the shit that he said about his family. I mean, he grew up in a very like obviously uh, his uh, parents were Italian immigrants, yeah. and he had like a really large family. Like I think it was five brothers and sisters. They were all much older, so he kind of goes into like his dad and like all his siblings and like what they you know what they inspired in him and like what he yeah. admired about them and stuff. And he said that the reason he became, like I said, he's essentially a renaissance man. Yes, he's probably best known for, you know, his special effects, like his gore, you know, makeup effects and stuff. But he was also an actor. He's a stunt man. He's a stunt coordinator. Um, he can dance. Yeah. And he just he does, do he, yeah, like you said, he does fencing. He I does think it, he can ride know. motorcycles. He can jump motorcycles, too, when he ride a dirt yeah. bike around stuff. Well, yeah, he was in, did you see uh, Night yeah. Riders yeah. from the 80s? Yeah, yeah he, he, they did like they did like jousting, but on motorcycles. He's good, you know, behind the camera, in front of the camera, special effects, stunts. Yeah, Just he does all that. Real shit. life, you know what I mean? You can send him to Vietnam. You can do whatever you want with him. You know, That's what I mean, him. and and I like he seems very humble. Yeah. Um, I think it's because one because he grew up poor. Um, two, it's because he said that he learned how to do all this stuff because he's like my dad. Um, he was like, you know, a carpenter, a plumber. He was, he could do like yeah. everything. And he's like, so I just thought, well, that's what you did. You just learned you just to do everything. Yeah. So that's kind of where he got that idea from. So he just, I'm, and I mean, now it's like, you know, he, he had, he opened a makeup school so he could like help other like younger artists that wanted to get into doing makeup. And he teaches them yeah. his techniques because he said that when he was growing up, he's like, you kind of had to figure it out for yourself because yeah. it's like, yeah, you had kind of your big deal makeup people. He's like, Dick Smith was really the only guy that would like tell you how he did shit. Yeah. And like would give them like the for- his secret formula for like the realistic looking blood and stuff yeah. like that. He's like, most of the other makeup artists working at the time were like real secretive. They were like magicians. Yeah. He's well, a magician he, too, by the way. He was a magician also. <laughs> and a lot of the special effects that he did in these horror movies were stuff that he made out of household implements. It's just all do-it-yourself stuff. Yeah, and again, you know, he that's said that's probably about, yeah. from because of his background, because he grew up poor, and he's like, yeah. you just kind of like worked with what you had. And he's like, so that's what I, that's kind of yeah. how I grew up, and that's how I learned I mean, you to can do see things. it, you know, and a lot of people that, you know, kind of come from money, their solution to everything is to buy something or to hire somebody. Yeah. And, you know, he wasn't, you know... Sweeney wouldn't like that. He yeah. Just, and he's just like, well, we're going to do the stunt. we got to put a cabinet here. Got to make a sink, you know. Yeah. we got to make blood. And the cool thing about it is that a lot of his effects, if you see, particularly, I mean, like I said, they go into it a little bit on this documentary, but if you see, like, the old documentary, again, that, that goes very into, like, how he did uh, specific effects in specific movies, it's it's much simpler than you would think it was. Like, it looks really good and it looks really elaborate, but when you see how it's done, you're like, oh, of course. You know, it's just yeah. like a magic trick. And he's, it's an illusion. Yeah, yeah, and that's what he um, kind of compared it to as well. That he's like, it's yeah. like a magic trick that you're trying to, like, fool people into, you know, showing. An interesting thing about him was that he seemed to, I mean, he's been in movies, obviously. He was from, from Dusk of Dawn. He was in Knight Riders. He was in a bunch of other things. And he's done uh, directing as well. He directed the Night of the Living Dead remake in 1990, which actually was really good with Tony Todd in it. Yeah. Um, but it seemed to me that what he always wanted, he wanted to be an actor. And he talked many times, because he's been in movies, he's also like did a lot of uh, work in the stage. Like I think it was in North Carolina. He said he kept going back like every season and like doing all their uh, live shows. And it seemed to me that that's what he wanted to do even maybe more than the makeup effects as much as he loved that and as good as he was at like all the sculpting and everything because he made like all those creatures like in creep show and stuff like fluffy and you know the the monster in the crate and whatever so he made all that shit but it seemed to me that he wanted to be an actor first and foremost because i think at one point he said a little bit wistfully that he was kind of sad that he never that he wouldn't be a leading man because he seemed very uh self-conscious about his looks He's not a bad looking guy. He wasn't. And that's what I mean. It's like when you see pictures of him young, he's like, all it took pretty much was that somebody made a comment about his nose being big. Yeah. And he kind of got really self-conscious about it. 
And I think that kind of, and he even said, he's like, I think that kind of hindered me later because I was always thinking about well, it. Well, you know, a lot of times in the movies tradition, they're going to put like an Anglo-American pretty boy in there as a lead. And or, I think that's what he Wayne was type. getting at too. Because because he was yeah. Italian and he was very right. clearly Italian looking. Well, he'd have made a good, you know, villain or, uh, right. you know, somebody who's, you know, you're flying against in another airplane, that type of deal. He does usually like play an villains. Adversary, an he adversary does usually type. play villains. Yeah, he, he's kind of had that dark, you know, hair and the mustache and, yeah yeah he, you know he definitely doesn't look like a pussy yeah you know well and he's definitely not definitely doesn't look like a pussy, does he? <laughs> and, you know i think um i always respected the guy's work i didn't know that he was actually a vietnam vet me being yeah. extra arm ex army you know i was in the 101st infantry and i uh, you know I, I i understood him a lot more because when you actually get deployed to any kind of war zone you know you you come back out of that appreciating things a lot more and you have like a lot of energy and uh because you're able to you've seen really bad shit or hard stuff regular stuff you know stuff that you find back in society is kind of easy compared to that it's not as threatening yeah so it's easier to overcome obstacles you're not hindering yourself so you know he just cut himself loose let's make movies let's have fun you know so he just did it and he Just seemed, it, one know? thing that I liked is that he seemed very candid about, I mean, that's a, a little bit how he got, I mean, yes, he got into like doing monster makeup from, you know, seeing Lon Chaney and Man of a Thousand Faces because that like fascinated him and stuff. Um, how you could like transform yourself into a completely different person. So he was into that from when he was a kid. But he said that his experiences in Vietnam, because his job was basically after like the bad shit happened, he had to be the first one in there to like take, take pictures, pictures of, of everything. It, yeah. So he's like, so I saw real life gore. Yeah. He's he, like, but I had like a little bit of distance from it because I was coming at it from behind a camera so I could pretend that yeah. it wasn't real. But he knew what people that, you know, were blown up, what they looked like. What that really looked what, like. What arms looked like just laying there, you know. Yeah, because he had yeah. seen it. Yeah. Um, and he was also very candid, too, about how kind of messed up he was when he came back from Vietnam. Um, yeah. You know, it kind of ruined his marriage at the time, even though he had joined the army, like, to support his uh, wife and child at the time. Yeah. And um, he's like, he come, he's like, because you just kind of have to shut off all your emotions, like, because you see all these horrible things all the time. So he's like, when you come back home, it's very difficult to undo that. Uh, so he was like well, it's very hard to connect with civilians. Yeah, and he Fair kind of got area, into yeah. that. But this was actually, like I said, he was actually surprisingly very candid, like yeah. about a, a lot of things that happened in his personal life, with his marriages. Uh, they interviewed like some of his grown daughters, uh, who seem like lovely people. Uh, one thing I love is that when they're kind of showing like what his life is like now, and so, you know, he's got a new wife. He's been married several times, uh, and he has several children, but. Uh, you know, all of which are grown, but he lives with the, the wife, the grown daughter and the daughter's son. And I love that he mentioned, like when he was talking about how, how he loved his family and stuff, he mentioned the two cats. So yeah. I was like, ah, oh, that's yeah. a, that's a point, point in your favor. It's like, yeah. I love when people mention their cats as part of the family. I think this one is probably the definitive documentary on Tom mm -hmm. you Would you say about the same? Oh yeah. I think it's the best one out there. Like I it's said. It's a fun to watch documentary. Yeah. You get to learn a lot about He's a fascinating him. guy. Yeah. And like I said, if you're more into like, um, you know, the way he did specific effects, it, you know, watch the old one first. Um, but then watch this one if you're more yeah. interested in this him as like a person. This is like Tom Savini, the man. Yeah, because yeah, it yeah. kind of goes more into, yeah. you know, yes, it goes into his effects work, but it also goes into, like, his personal life and, yeah. like, his stunt work and his acting and stuff like yeah, that, you get too. Yeah, you get a lot of, like, testimony from actors that have worked with him and everything and stories and shit. You know, yeah, and, I mean, everybody seems Everybody's to think he's just, like, the greatest guy ever, mm -hmm. which he, which is nice because that is always how he came across to me, and I'd be, really, like, really bummed out if I found out that he was, he's like, not, a real dickwad. No, he's, he's <laughs> not he's really, not. he's not fronting, he's not trying to be something that he isn't, he's exactly that. That guy right he's there. a very like yeah, yeah he's a very genuine person he right. just comes across like that you know i don't detect any kind of like uh uh what do you call it? inadequacies in that man he doesn't he, like you know what i mean he isn't there's some guys that are out there you know in the public eye and they really don't feel good about themselves because they're kind of like a sham some of these guys yeah there's not as much to them as you know they want you know as meet the eye well not with tom savini <laughs> Yeah. Tom, there's a lot more to Tom Savini than meets the eye. And he definitely comes he across as yeah. somebody that, one, he's very humble. Two, yeah. he kind of knows where he came from. Yeah. And he comes across as as he knows how lucky he is. Yeah, that he, he's And he's like living the dream. And he's like, you know, whatever happens, is, that's cool. He is self-actualized. 
That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Shutter has got this yeah. right now. It's about an hour and a half long. Um, like I said, from a technical standpoint, it's not like you know the most uh, you know elegant documentary I've ever seen, but. It's um you Fun. know if you yeah if you're into Savini it's really really fascinating yeah. um and I really really enjoyed it and he really enjoyed it too and yeah. learned a lot about time I mean I knew most of that stuff yeah. except for the stuff about like, I know everything his about marriage him. and stuff I knew he had been in Vietnam and stuff, I just thought he was a special that. effects guy but you know you see him as acting sometimes you know I really didn't think a lot. but yeah he does tons yeah, of other shit and like I said he stuff. opened that makeup school and all that yeah. other kind of stuff too so, so yeah. he's kind of like a Renaissance man and uh, and I'm really really happy that this documentary got made because he's an awesome person and. And uh, there should be more people like him, really. <laughs> All right. So the second one that we're going to talk about is a Netflix original. Now, I'm going to say this right on, off the bat. Now, originally, I was going to review... Because remember when we did the show about Canadian crime and we were talking about that jackhole, Luca Mignotta. Oh, yeah. And remember I said, oh, they're doing that Netflix series called Don't Fuck With Cats? Yeah. Okay, well, that dropped like yesterday or the day before. And so it was between Don't Fuck With Cats and Klaus. Yeah. And I'm sitting there like last night. I'm like, man, I was just like, I had a long day and I was just kind of like... I really do not want to watch something about a yeah. cat killer right now. Yeah. We will probably review it next week, though, because I do want to see it. I said, I'm more in the mood for, like, a Christmas animated yeah. movie. I was just like, I don't need this shit after my day. So we uh, watched Klaus instead. Now, I have to say, this is Netflix uh, Netflix's first original animated film. Not bad. Um, it is... Delightful. Yeah, it was bad. a delightful movie. This was actually um, written and directed by Sergio Pablos. Um, now, this guy actually worked for Disney for a very long time and worked as an animator on some of their like classic movies like Aladdin, uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame. Um, I don't think The Lion King, but some of the other ones like right around that time period. And he had been wanting to open his own animation studio, which he did recently. I believe it's in Madrid. And what he wanted to do... He said that he was shooting for, he's like, I wanted to make a movie that was hand-drawn animation. That is what hand-drawn animation would look like if all the animation studios hadn't gone to, like, computer animation, right. like, in the interim. It looks hand-drawn, but it looks better. It, it is hand-drawn. Yeah. Um, so as far as I, you used computer assistance. I'm not sure um, how much computer assistance there was. I mean, basically this looks good. This is a hand drawn film, and yeah. that was kind of one of one of the things that he wanted to do when he opened his animation studio was make this. Now this has taken like a long time to get made because I guess they were first like throwing around the idea in like 2014, 2015. Um, he couldn't really get the funding for it because they thought it was too risky because it's hand drawn animation, too expensive, blah blah blah. But in 2017, Netflix decided to fund it and uh, said, yeah, yes, make it. We will give you the money and, you know, we'll release it in December it's of Christmas 2019. Movie. It's a Christmas yes. It's a Santa Claus origin story. Yes. It's like an alternate yeah. story for the origin of Santa Claus. Yeah. It's pretty entertaining. But it's yeah. kind of like, yeah. So it's kind of like there's this snotty, lazy, rich kid named Jesper. And I believe it's set in the 19th century. Like, I guess somewhere yeah. in the Arctic Circle. They don't, or somewhere, you know, in the, up there. And they don't, they don't really specify where. It's in the honky motherland. The honky motherland, as Tom yeah. calls it. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? So, apparently his dad is, like, a postmaster general. And he has, like, this big, like, they've made their fortune, like, through the postal service. Or, like, you know, he owns the postal companies or whatever. But his son is such a bum that just lays around on his shay's lounge like drinking espresso all the time and ordering servants around so he sends this lazy son out to this little nowhere village uh called smearinsburg that's going like out in the middle of nowhere and he says you have to live there for a year and you have to like you know send six thousand letters through the mail and then you can come back he's like and if you don't do it i'm cutting you out of the well so this like snotty kid goes to this town that's full of like these fucking it's like a village that's two extended families that hate each other it's like the hatfields and the mccoys yeah. and so like the whole time they're just constantly trying to like just doing horrible shit to each other so he kind of gets into that they all hate his guts no one writes letters because they all hate each other so he's like what am i gonna do and then finally he meets klaus who is this big Santa Claus looking dude, essentially, but he looks really kind of big and scary. He lives like on his own out in the forest and he makes toys. And so the whole movie is like 
their friendship developing, um, him kind of changing the town for the better, like the kind of the whole theme of the movie, I guess kind of the theme of Christmas too. It's yes, it's like a Santa Claus origin story, like an alternate origin story for Santa Claus, but it's also kind of like, you know, the central theme of the movie being, you know, one act of kindness spurs other acts of kindness. And soon, like, he just one thing that he decided to do, like, changed this whole, uh, you know, town for the better, changed everything for the better. Um, but it's this is actually, I really, really liked this movie. It was, like, really kind of, um, it, it's not really Disney-like. It sort of is, I guess, because the guy was, like, a Disney anime. I mean, the animation is beautiful. It kind of reminds me of the much older ones, you know, the Chris Kringle yeah, and all that, like yeah. ones that were stop motion. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of that type of that. It type had of story. a little bit of that look to it. Yeah. And um, I just, the character design was really cool. Like, especially all of the, um, like, all of the horrible villagers. Like, uh, you know, the, it's like two families, like the Crumbs and the Ellingbows. And I think Mrs. Crumb was the name of the one character with, like, that crazy hair or hat or whatever it was that she had. But all of them are, like, really strange looking and like almost kind of look like Adam's family sort of shit. And there's all this kind of other kind of stuff, but the character design is really cool. The story is really cool. It's just like such a, I, I think this is going to be one of those ones that people are just going to like watch every year. This, cause this just kind of came out of nowhere. It's just really nice animation. It's, it's just like a really nice, like heartwarming yeah. type of story. It has a very classic look to it. Oh I, yeah. I liked how it looked. Um, the storytelling was pretty straightforward. The only thing I really didn't like, I liked it overall. Yeah. The only thing, I, the only thing that I didn't really like is I thought that the music selection, because it would break out into musicals, was very contemporary, and it kind of clashed to me. I thought with that, yeah. with that Victorian motif. I could have done without. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it would have been better with a classical score. Yeah. And which, almost like a retro musical, so it sounded like yeah. something that came out of the '40s or something that came out of the '60s, maybe. You know, like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, you know, the music yeah. that went along with that one, you know? That something like that Burr Lives or something like that. In yeah, it. that would have been kind of cool. It maybe, it, I think it should have had, like, maybe classic Christmas music in it. That's kind of the only thing. I mean, That's it wasn't, I didn't it wasn't like. distracting because I think, I mean, they put, like, a contemporary, like, pop song in there just at one point, like, yeah. during kind of a montage type of scene. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I could have done without that. Um, and, you know, the, it, they, did, they did it during the end credits, too, but that wasn't really that big a deal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I would have gone it, for a more totally more classic motif, particularly because this was set, yeah, you know, a long time setting. ago. I right. mean, I guess it was supposed to be the 19th century, but to me, it seemed older. Right. You know what I mean? Like it seemed like a very old kind of because you know, they're just the way the villages were. It's 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 a fairy tale type setting. I would have had fucking Bing Crosby style fucking Christmas carols in it and shit like that. I think that yeah, was, I'm gonna let yeah, I or think, even just like not even vocal stuff. Yeah, maybe just like stuff with sleigh bells stuff. or you right. know something like that, just to give it more of a classic type of feel. That's, yeah, but that's really the only that's thing really the only thing I could see that I that I can really ding like it on. I mean, yeah. other than that, it's like the characterization is great, the voice acting is great, the animation is gorgeous. Um, it's just it's a it's a really charming story of like how all this. How all the things about Santa, like the flying sleigh, the reindeer, where like where from. all that came from, you yeah. know what I mean? And it's kind of funny, like how they sort of played with it. I like think, where it, it came you from. know, if I was a kid, I probably would have enjoyed it a lot more. I was just critiquing it mostly as an adult. Yeah. You know what I mean? But if I was, you know, seven, eight, nine, I probably wouldn't fucking just loved it, you know? And I definitely, I mean, I definitely think that this is one that like the whole family can enjoy. Right. You know what I mean? It's not annoying for adults uh, you know it has like a really nice heartfelt story like you know the character aren't the characters aren't like zany like over the top or annoying or anything but then there's shit in there that will entertain a kid also um but you know it has like a really nice message like a really nice look to it so i definitely think that this is going to become like a christmas classic yes. along the lines of like some it's of those probably not ones. one of the last that you'll see of these either maybe not and uh, honestly um this Netflix specifically got this into theaters for a limited release so they could put it in for Oscar contention of mm -hmm. uh, best animated feature. So we'll see how that goes because they did get a limited theatrical release. It didn't play here, but um, it's been on Netflix for, I guess, since the end of November or something like that. And I've been meaning to see it because I do like Christmas movies. So 
I mean, not stupid Lifetime or Hallmark yeah, yeah. Channel Christmas movies. Those are horrible. <laughs> but like, <laughs> but other kinds. I like Christmas horror movies and yeah. Christmas cartoons. And then that's about it. But yeah, definitely if you need something like heartwarming and lovely to watch for the Christmas season, you could certainly do worse than this. This is actually a really, really good movie. And I really, really like it. Okay, and for our third movie watching experience this week, we actually went to the theater finally and saw Knives Out. Yeah. I've been wanting to see this since I saw the first fucking trailer, however she's, long ago that was. She's been wanting to see it. I thought the trailer looked pretty good. I, I had, you know, I really kind of had to set my principles aside to go see this movie because I'm one of the Phantom Menace types guys that... I didn't like what Ryan Johnson did with fucking Star Wars. And I was like, I mean, I will never watch one of that motherfucker's movies again. I was <laughs> mad. I was mad. I was calling him Roundhead Rian Johnson, you know, and I was misgendering him, calling him a her, just doing everything, getting mad at him. That's you know? dumb. So I will never <laughs> watch one of those dudes' movies again. He's made a lot of good movies, though. I saw this movie, and it was a fucking good movie. I liked he made it. Looper. He made yeah. Brick. He made, like, a lot of good it movies. It was funny. It was funny. It was... It was... It... He knew he knows the genre. He hit that genre real well. I remember growing up in the '70s, seeing these old whodunits back when mm -hmm. they used to make them. And th this is it. It's a modern interpretation of it. Yeah. Um, I'm still, you know, there, there's funny fucking politics in it. He kind of makes fun of all politics, like on the right and the left. I guess there's a bunch of jokes about family. It's about a fucking horrible family, who the patriarch who makes all the money is found dead up on his sofa and somebody hires this world famous detective to come in here and try to figure out what happened to him and you know of course the family's all right they they're, they they want the inheritance and they're all fucking parasites you know and it's just it, it, it's it's a fucking nasty family there's i don't think there's a single good person in that family not really <laughs> they're all kind of terrible yeah and then well, Tony Collette's character, yeah. her daughter is all right, but yeah. she, well, she comes across, she seems all right, but then at the end, she's just as much of a shit They're as all the bad. rest of them. Yeah. They're just all, yeah. But They're all bad. the thing about it, though, is that all the characters are kind of terrible people, and yet they are super yeah. fun to watch. The only, it's an, the only one that's any good is the little maid, and the maid is played she's by... She's a nurse, not a she's maid. She's a nurse, that's right. Yeah. The little nurse. Uh, they treat her like a maid, though. They tell her to go get well, stuff. Yeah, I forget. the help and everything. Yeah, the help, yeah. <laughs> The nurse is uh, that same actress uh, that played uh, Joy out of... Uh, yeah, Anna de Armas. Anna de Armas. That's yeah. her name. Yeah, she played she's Joy. Cuban of, she's a Cuban actress. Played Joy out of the new Blade Runner movie. She's cute as hell. Uh, she is, she's adorable. Yeah, and then there's like a, um all-star cast. Got Craig, this, oh, Daniel Craig. Amazing. Knocked the out cast of is fucking amazing yep. in this. Don Johnson, he fucking did a great <laughs> He's job. He's got in this too. Chris Evans, fucking, yep. uh, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis, Jamie Lee obviously Curtis, Tony Collette. Yep. It's like, this just is, I can't, I can't believe they got a fucking cast of this caliber. Yeah. And like I said, it's, I've read some other reviews of that that are saying it's almost kind of like a quote-unquote subversion <laughs> of the whodunit. I don't know if I would call it that. It's almost kind of like it's like an homage because obviously Ryan Johnson was like a huge fan of like Agatha Christie murder mysteries. And so this is structured very much like that, but in a way that it's kind of, I don't want to say that it's like winking at conventions of the genre. It sort of is, but it's also a classic example of the yeah. genre. If that makes any sense, it's not making fun of it. It's not, I mean, it's just like those old, if you guys remember like old ones they did in the seventies, um, you know, they, well, a lot of the which were based on Agatha Christie novels. They just kind of had fun with it. This yeah. is this almost reminds me of Clue. You know, with the one with um, you know, uh, yeah. what's it fucking shit? Oh my god, my fucking head I don't, just. I don't, I don't remember. Uh, 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 I can't remember his fucking name. I don't remember the guy that was in the... Legend, a Rocky Horror Picture Show. What's his? Oh, oh, name? the guy who played the devil. Yeah. What yeah. The fuck was, is... Now you got me to forget his name. Oh shit. I um, can't believe I just fucking forgot his name. You knew that is. Guy yeah. played Riff Raff. I don't, no, not Riff Raff. He played Dr. Uh, Frankenfurter. Oh, okay, Dr. Frankenfurter. What's his name? Oh, shit. Okay, I'll remember his name. I'll remember later. But yeah, so. Uh, yeah, so the one with that movie, Clue, it's like a, le a slightly less zany version of that. Yeah. But 
in in like the best possible way because it's it's almost kind of like you can tell that all the characters like all the actors that are in this are having a fucking blast like playing these terrible and yet highly yeah. entertaining people daniel craig's got this really fucking cheesy ass southern accent that he just, just leans into that that's shit, just man. fake as hell as yeah, but they like they like make and fun and of it too. Like, fun of it. You, man, you got the foghorn, leghorn, <laughs> southern like, accent. Uh, just, yeah, it's funny. It's funny. I well, I kind of feel like, and like I said, I think this movie is doing a lot better than they expected. So Ryan Johnson has said that he's like he'd like to do another um, movie with that character. Um, whose his name is Benoit Blanc. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Benoit Blanc. <laughs> so it's like I yeah. like I love that it's like ridiculous, but. It's also like a really good mystery. Like for real, I you will not guess where the fuck this is going. Yeah. Because lots of twists in one it. One thing, yeah, one thing that I think a lot of people mean when they say it's a subversion is that you almost find out what you think is the solution to the mystery like really soon in the movie and you're like, "Oh, what the fuck?" Don't now, ruin it. Don't ruin it. No, I'm not. And then he's like, "Well, where the fuck are they going to go with that?" But it's like it it just the yeah. way that it's constructed, yeah. I mean the 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 screenplay, the plot, and it's everything. It's a twist is, upon a twist upon a twist upon a twist, or yeah. you, or it's a donut, a hole <laughs> yeah. inside of a donut, <laughs> with, with the, a with donut the in a hole and a hole in a donut. If you see the hole, movie, then, you know what we're talking that. about. Yeah. Yeah. But it's yeah. like it's just I, I just love that everyone is just like yeah. playing the shit out of this. You can tell that everyone had a fucking blast making this. It's like. It's really, it's really well plotted. Like I said, you will not guess where the fuck this is going because it's just, it's twisting and turning, but not in a way that you're like, oh, come on now, or nothing like that. Because it's like shit that happens like at the end, then you remember like shit that happens to begin. It's like, oh, he set that up. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? So it's like really, really good the way everything. It all interlocks. It all interlocks with each other. So it's like when you get to the end and shit that seems like it came out of left field, it didn't because he set it up at the beginning. Yeah. And so it's all like makes yeah. sense. It's yeah, like every little puzzle. Was, yeah. Every little puzzle piece fits normal. in there. Yeah. But it's like, I, I would be very surprised. I mean, we still have a, like another week to go and we probably, we're probably going to see um, Jumanji and we're probably yeah. going to see Star Wars and yeah. we're probably going to see stuff like that. And that'll probably be on next week's show. But I would be, what we should do for next week's show too is, I already kind of wrote down some of these. I wanted, since it's the end of the year, we should probably write down what our favorite movies of the year were that we saw. Okay. Um, since I, was, I, I would be shocked if this, I mean, this is definitely in my top 10. Definitely. I mean, I had a fucking blast with this movie. It's like, it's funny as shit. Um, everybody looked like they had a great time. It's, and I love whodunits anyway. Like that's, and I'm, and I'm really happy that like someone is making one that's kind of like an old school one, but also a little bit of an update. Um, so... I would definitely, definitely recommend this. Um, you know, I know people were like fucking crying about The Last Jedi and all that other yeah. kind of crap. And like I said, I he's admit, made, he's made other, like a lot of other movies too. I got <laughs> you know it, what I, I mean? A lot of other good movies. I gotta admit, I was wrong about Rian Johnson. I was wrong about him. This is the kind of, this is the kind of movie he needs to make. Well, this is what he's wanted to this, make. Yeah, you can yeah. tell that this yeah. is something that he's been wanting to make since he was a kid. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so it just feels like it's just so cool. It's just like this old, just all of the old tropes of yeah. like Clue and stuff like that. Tim Curry, God damn it. Yeah, Tim, Tim Curry. Curry. Yeah, Tim Curry. Why could I not remember that? You remembered it. Yeah. yeah. But it took that long. Um, you know, all the tropes of Clue is like this big old gloomy mansion. It's like yeah. there's a murder maybe that Yeah, and they laughed at it. There's like he's living in a mansion right out of Clue. Yeah, it's like so they so they are yeah. like kind of winking at the conventions, yeah. but also it's a really good example of the convention. So it's not like trying to shit on it. It's not trying. You can tell that they're having fun with it. Yeah, you can tell that you know that Ryan Johnson is like really into these kind of movies and really wanted to make a good entertaining like old school type of who done it. Yeah. And I definitely think he succeeded and like i said the cast is all fucking great um it's a big cast so some you know some of the actors don't get quite as much screen time as you might like all star cast but all -star i mean cast, yeah. everybody when they're on screen they just knock it out of the park they're yep. just really funny it's just yep. like there's just even like some of the fucking throwaway jokes are yeah. fucking great you know what i mean even the bad acting is good because they're acting bad on purpose that's what I mean. Yeah. They're leaning into like yeah. the ridiculousness, and Daniel Craig's and, and, character is like just yeah. the best. At Where that. this comes from, you know, when we were kids, our parents back in the seventies used to watch this kind of shit on television, and even like sometimes you'd have whodunits. They'd be making fun of whodunits, and like on the Carol Burnett show. Yeah, they'd have it, and then just you know, what I mean, it was a trope. Yeah, for them to like do a scene, a whodunit scene, because there were whole movies like that. Yep. 
and they were happening on trains and just it just it was part of the genre yeah and you know fucking sex dr- drugs were part of the humor they were always making sexual innuendos and fucking there was drug and alcohol humor in it and a bunch of politically incorrect shit happening you know they were they were supposed to be outrageous Outra- you know yeah they were supposed to be kind of outrageous and fucking daring and we were talking about it before because I mean the Who Done It is such an um, is such a you know an old literary format yeah. that you know if people are saying now oh it's subverting the genre or whatever it's like yeah that's but that's the, the genre was well and the genre has been subverted because like yeah. I said the Agatha Christie books are very very old it's like they've been yeah. parodied they've been it's yeah. like even back in the fucking sixties and the seventies yeah. so like I said this is not like making fun of it it's like the pa- the parodies were better than the originals. Some of them were yeah, in a lot of ways. Some of them were. because it gave it gave the comics you know the chance to do things that were unacceptable. You know yeah. What I mean? Like you talk to a female slut shaming characters, just <laughs> fucking funny shit. Yeah. Funny shit. Yeah. But like I said, if you're into Clue, this this is a bit like Clue, but like I said, not quite as not quite as over the top. I, I mean, I love Clue. We should probably review that on yeah. the retrospective at some point because I fucking love that movie. But it's it's not quite as over the top and zany as that. It's a little more, I don't want to say deadpan because that's not exactly right. But it's kind of like the tone is more playful. It's yeah, it's more of a playful tone. It's not yeah. so much like an over the top word. Because yeah. in Clue, like everyone was kind of like running around and like, oh my god, you know what I mean? There's like also that. a little bit of everything. There's car chases in it. There's fight scenes every now and then. There's a bunch of good arguments. Just fucking funny jokes. Funny insults. Yeah, it's just like all of them like playing Every, off each other. It's so so funny. You got char- lefty characters shaming righty characters and righty characters shaming lefty characters, and they're all shit. Yeah, it's like yeah, every, like, like I shit. said, everyone yeah. is terrible except shit. for it's the detective, up. except for like the one yeah. protagonist. It's yeah. like everyone in this family is it's a fucking terrible funny. person, it's fucking funny and it's just shit. like funny to watch like the different ways in which yeah. they are terrible. Yeah, but and, uh, and yeah, having you know, when I came out of the army for a few years, I worked in worked in Wellesley, West and Newton and Dover, which is out there in Massachusetts, and this is set in partly in Massachusetts. I think some of them were from New York. Yeah, uh, according to, but. I think the house was supposed to be in Massachusetts. Yeah. I, I when I was like. there, you know, I worked uh, uh, with some of the richest families in the United States, and um, this this movie nails it. That's the, what they're like. Yeah, that's like I said, it's not like. in the. They're not what you think they're like. <laughs> well, like I said, and that's why I keep comparing it to Clue. But it's like, I mean, Clue. They were obviously characters, and it was like a farce, and yeah. it was supposed to be like that. This is less farcical, yeah. because the characters are. Over the top, but not in an unrealistic no. way. I mean, you could totally imagine everything about them is stereotypical. This shit happening yeah. in real life. Everything about it was everything about them was like some kind of stereotype. I personally ran into in those yeah. in those families. Yeah, you it know? was totally believable. Shit, tons of money. None of it they made themselves. Uh, fucking crazy political beliefs on the right and the left that don't affect any of them at all. Yeah. Just fucking just everything is a par- they, 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 some of them were kind of parodies of themselves it's funny yeah but and like I said like there's one guy in the family that makes all the money the rest of them are just parasites on him and yeah. that's, ba- that's basically what was happening in this yeah. yeah and so like I said in that way like a classic whodunit and yeah. just the way th- this does not go in the way that you would expect mm-hmm. at all but not right. in a bad way it's like it's the the solution to the mystery and the solution like the end is really like really really satisfying because yeah. when you get to the end you realize that every single thing was set up yeah. so this definitely seems like one that you need to see like two times because like I said I think I missed like even some of the like throw away throwaway lines and stuff like that because all the dialogue and this is so great um, that I'm sure I missed some of it because I was laughing well you know it was definitely written to be a donut hole inside a hole <laughs> with a donut inside a hole with a hole inside the I hole. just I died I was laughing, laughing when he went to that I died show. laughing at that Daniel Craig is so fucking who knew he was so funny well you don't expect him to be funny because you don't all expect the teams him to, yeah stupid. because he's like always so grizzled and yeah but stern then, yeah but, but he's he like actually very very funny when he wants to be yeah he's and funny in so this. I really like that he's kind of like playing against the usual type yeah. and he totally he totally nails it yeah. I mean, there's just like a... Bad southern accent and all. Yeah, and there's just like, just he's like, he was the biggest surprise for me, like him being like really, really funny. But Carried everybody everybody in this is like so good. And Save I just, the girl, though. The oh, yeah. 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 She Well, I, I loved her in uh, yeah. Blade Runner 2049. She's been yeah. in some other shit, too, but it's like... Everybody, everybody did a good job. Don Johnson was refreshing to see. 
He did a good job. He Don looks. Did, he's got to be old as shit, but he doesn't. Really, he doesn't really look that looks different. Great. Looks great, and he re- he uh, fucking really he nailed that role. He really did. Yeah. It's just this is just this is one of the best times I think I had in the theater, like the most enjoyable times. This was actually funnier than some comedies that we saw. The whole audience was year. enjoying it. Yeah, and it's like there was more people in there than I thought, and it's been yeah. playing for a yeah. while, so I didn't think. And it, it was, was we went to see it like in the middle of the day. Middle of the day, and it was more than half full. And it was yeah, there was like a shit ton of people. Yeah. So I feel like some people are probably seeing it more than once, like I said, because yeah. it's one I heard of those them talking about it and referring back to certain things that had happened, kind of like they had seen it a couple of times. Yeah, so I I definitely feel like this is one that will reward multiple viewings because, mm. like I said, you know, the more times you see it, once you know what the resolution of the mystery is, Wolf. The, the resolution of the mysteries, I guess, because uh, yeah. there's a bunch of them. But, you know, when, and then you can go back and, like, see, like, where all the shit went, because it yeah. r- definitely does all fit together. And, like I said, yeah. there's probably a lot of lines in there that I missed because I was laughing at something else. Um, and so I have to go back there to appreciate the screenplay. And yeah, stuff. so but, I give it a thumbs up. Yeah, I definitely, definitely really, really like the one. And, and yeah. like I said, I, I find it hard to believe that it wouldn't be one of my favorite ones of the year because I definitely had a really good time with it. Good this flick. Movie. Yeah. Had fun, yeah. So I'm, you know, I am I was waiting to see this and I was like really, really happy that it was exceeded my expectations. It was actually much better than I was expecting. <laughs>